The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. We're back in the House of Mystery on KKNW 1150 AM Seattle. I'm your host, Al Warren, and Kevin is back. Hey, I am here. Yeah, Mr. Sick Man. <laughs> Mr. Flu Man. I can't believe how many people were sick this last week um, with the flu. Oh, my Lord. Yeah, we had to reschedule an interview, in fact. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, actually, even Dave was, yeah. So, now, and we, uh, we want to thank a couple of new stations, uh, KVFX 98.3 FM in Utah, as well as K-Y-A-H, I can't say that, k in 540 AM <laughs> Salt Lake, because they've joined the family, and they're, they're airing us now five days a week at 4 o'clock Mountain Time. It's fantastic to have some new listeners, new stations, and um, hopefully they'll keep listening. <laughs> <laughs> Not with now. Uh, now today we are talking with Ron Francel. He is a noted author of several books: *The Darkest Night*, *Morgue*, uh, *Delivered from Evil*, uh, *Outlaw Los Angeles*. Just an incredible amount of reading. You want to read? Read his books. So uh, welcome, Ron. Well, thank you me and uh, hello to all your new Utah listeners yeah hopefully they uh, like us <laughs> oh, let's, let's hope I'm sure they will well you know uh, true crime is a big thing everywhere even in, even in uh, Utah and uh, yes it is now did you know it's illegal to threaten somebody with an unloaded gun uh, in Texas no, I didn't know that, but uh, <laughs> given the number of guns in Texas, uh, I would say it, it, being illegal is the least of the, the, the person's <laughs> problem. I think they could be shot down by four or five bystanders before we get to the legal question. So, <laughs> I, was, I was starting to say, is there such a thing as an unloaded gun in Texas? <laughs> Uh, true. I, 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 you, maybe it's illegal to have to point an unloaded gun because it's just stupid. Well, I just, I just love it because now we get this from uh, Factinate, which is a website that talks about uh, um, weird or old laws that are still on the books that haven't uh, <laughs> haven't been updated. It's kind of crazy. Um, some of them like that. Uh, so I guess uh, you're in Texas. You carry a loaded gun all the time. Well, no, I don't. But but uh, I'm I'm aware of all the people who do, and uh, it's <laughs> a yeah, it's it's both frightening and comforting at the same time. <laughs> you know, if something's going to happen in the theater or in the restaurant, I'm I'm pretty confident that somebody in the room uh, can shoot back. Um, it's not going to be me, uh, but I'm I'm sure it could be. But on the other hand, um, I'm not so sure of a lot of these people, so they they might be the problem more than the solution. So I don't know. Yeah, I guess that would be a big problem in a sense. How would you determine who you can trust or not trust in a case like that? Well, sure. You know, that would be the the weird thing. I know in the last book that I finished that went, that went out about the Australian killers, like the Port Arthur um, mass shooting, um, mm -hmm. th that was a big problem when he was running around shooting people. In fact, people would stop because they thought he, the shooter was running to get away, and they'd stop their car to pick him up, and then he would shoot them. So mm. it, it, it's kind of, a, I think it confused a lot of people there. So. Uh. I wrote about the uh, Luby's Cafeteria uh, massacre in 92, 91 or 92, here in Colleen, Texas, and in which um, a, a mass murderer named uh, George Hennard crashes his truck into the, the Luby's Cafeteria, crashes through the plate glass window, and, and comes to rest in the middle of the dining room. 
uh, people are stunned by this, thinking somebody's had a heart attack. But in 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 a moment, he gets out of his car and starts shooting people, uh, point blank. Uh, among the people in the restaurant is is a woman uh, named Susanna Hupp, and Susanna has a license to carry, but in Texas at the time, it was illegal to bring your gun into a restaurant. She she had it in her car, but not in her purse where it normally was. Uh, early in this massacre, she had the chance, uh, was only six feet away from the shooter, and had the chance to have shot him if she had had her gun. Um, she didn't and he went on to kill 22, 23 people. Um, and, and there's an example of the good guy with a gun might be able to limit the, uh, the death, the, the body count, if you will, mm -hmm. um, if, if they have that chance. Uh, in her case, she didn't have that chance. Uh, in Texas today, she would... But uh, let's hope she doesn't have to. Uh, we, so we have examples on both sides. Uh, we have the example of the, the fellow who ended the uh, Sutherland, the re very recent Sutherland Springs massacre here in Texas. Uh, the good guy with a gun is real. It really happens. Um, it, it doesn't, it's, not as, it's not as big a story maybe in the media, but... Uh, it does happen, and um, arguments can be made uh, for wider gun ownership. Um, I, I also hear the arguments against wider gun ownership. I, I, um, I, I'm, not, I'm not an ardent supporter or opponent of either, but as a student of mass murder for the last 10 years, um, I, I see a lot of examples where wider gun ownership prevented deaths. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm kind of the same way. I'm kind of in between. Uh, I hear both stories. I think it sort of has to be done to fit the country or the state that does it, because some countries can 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 work really really well with um, pretty strict gun control. Whereas I, I don't think sure. I don't think the states would get away with it. I don't think it would work. Well, and I, I think it's the kind of uh, is a kind of decision that that should rest in state law. I, I believe what what uh, Massachusetts or Connecticut might want to do is certainly different than what Texas or Wyoming is inclined to do. Uh, I think that. In most cases, I believe that kind of decision lies with the states, um, and certainly on crime, uh, I, uh, that those are the people who are responding are local law enforcement. It, the FBI doesn't rush to the scene of a mass shooting unless the FBI office happens to be next door. Uh, it's local law enforcement, and I think that those kinds of those kinds of laws and those kinds of sensibilities lie generally with the states. Now, having said that, um, I, I take it that you don't see any chance for uh, national reciprocity with everybody recognizing carry concealed. Yeah, I, I, you know, I think there's some wisdom in it, but I can't imagine um, Connecticut thinking that the guy to whom Texas gives the right to carry a gun should be allowed to come to Connecticut and, uh, and enjoy the same protections. So, I, yeah, I, I would give that a low chance. Um, I, I don't disagree with the idea, but, um, again, we get back to, to individual states being able to determine uh, how, how that's going to go. Uh, I don't think we should um, inflict Texas's sensibilities on Connecticut or vice versa. Mm -hmm. hmm. So do you, when, you, when you write about um, mass crimes, what is it that you look for when you, um, 
what what part of the story is is most intriguing to you? Uh, the one the the book that I did about mass killings, that, which included serial killers and mass murderers and spree killers. Um, I was looking for one thing. I was looking for survivors who had put their lives back together. Uh, and that was a harder hunt than you might think. Uh, I was looking for people who exhibited that kind of resilience that we hope we would have if we were in that situation. If we survived an attack by a... Um, um, a terrorist or a mass murderer or a serial killer, we want to believe that we could put our lives back together, restore some semblance of normalcy, um, and, and live out our days. The hard part of that was that uh, out of 60 survivors of mass murders over the past 70 years that I could identify, um, I would say that there were only between 12 and 15 that I would say had put their lives back together. So in that case, I was looking for a survivor who was reasonably a, a, a readjusted to life. Uh, that's, that's a rare thing. Uh, in general, when I write about crime, though, I'm looking for a bigger story. I'm looking for something that reflects our our culture, uh, our humanity, uh, something more than just a salacious, bloody story with shocking photos. I, yeah. I'm, that that market exists, and I don't I don't judge, but I'm looking to tell a deeper deeper story. Um, that, that has some literary uh, uh, chances for me. And, and so, in general, I just want to tell a good story that's meaningful. It's not just uh, exploitive. It, it, it means something at the end. Yeah, it, it sounds uh, like I, you're... You, but... It, <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it sounds like you're wanting to write about the resilience of the human spirit after a tragedy. Well, certainly in Delivered from Evil, that was a theme. That was the theme, uh, was resilience. And I, my, my interest, and many of my colleagues in crime writing's interest, is in the victim. Uh, it's uh, the, the victim who dies is, can be very, very interesting, but the victim who survives uh, is, has, has uh, a quality to me, that's fascinating. Uh, in my book, The Darkest Night, about uh, the crime, a uh, horrible crime against two of my childhood friends when we were kids, has two victims, sisters, who were abducted and terrorized, raped, and, and, and then thrown off a very high bridge into a very deep canyon. Um, one dies and one survives. And the book becomes ultimately about the one who survived and, and the horror of, of living after a crime. Uh, dying is bad enough. Living with the horror after a crime can be worse. That must really kind of uh, devastate the community as well. Oh, sure. I, I, I think that uh, the, the smaller the town, the more devastating uh, a horrible crime is. In that particular case, this is a crime that's alive in the memory of that small town, even today, 40-something years after it happened. Uh, in fact, the uh, New York Daily News just had a story about that crime this past weekend. Uh, it's 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 lying there very close to the surface, not only in the memory but in the history of the place. And I think that uh, the, the when we drop a stone into the water, it it sends forth all these ripples. Well, so the the crime is a stone, and we drop it out there into our history, and it sends forth these these ripples that reverberate over generations. Uh, into the future, uh, uh, 
I'm on Facebook today, and um, uh, 40, I'm going to add it up here, four, almost 45 years later, um, I've, I've had uh, a second and third generation of the killers um, uh, family reach out to me through, through modern technology and social media uh, with questions that are startling about is this in their DNA? Are, do they have tendencies? Uh, 45 years later, uh, think about that. that. And so the, the reverberation of these crimes over time is fascinating. And I'm not, a, I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a criminologist. I'm not a sociologist. I'm just an observer. I'm a journalist. Um, but I'm fascinated by that. And uh, I would like for sociologists and a, a psychologist and uh, a criminologist to, to, to reach out to me and tell me why this is. But from a storyteller's perspective, um, it's important because it's reflecting us to us. And, and I think a book has no greater purpose, and maybe especially in true crime than leaving us with something, something more than a titillation. Uh, I don't like the supermarket, the typical supermarket true crime, because I think it's too salacious and too exploitive. I want to tell a story, and I want that story to mean something uh, and to reflect who we are so that if we need to, if we, need to we can change. Um, Truman Capote started that. Uh, <laughs> people like Vincent Bugliosi and James Elroy have continued that, um, or did continue it. Uh, but uh, I, I, I think that's very important. I don't think true crime has can be just about bloody pictures and salacious testimony and, and grim autopsy. Um, Reports. I, I think it has to be. It has to speak to our hearts. What do you think about the um, reporting by uh, groups that um, suggest that none of these mass killings ever happened? They were false flags and uh, create, uh, false flags. Yeah, so. created by the government yeah. just to just to take away guns and or whatever the point point behind it would be. But basically, there were actors and and none of these things have happened. As a journalist for my entire life, uh, any, any manipulation of the truth is abhorrent to me. I, uh, I don't care who you are, and I don't care what your position is. If you've manipulated the truth to make a point, you're just a common liar, and you ought to be treated as a common liar. Uh, so any of those, I, I, regardless of the point they're trying to make, uh, make it with the truth or go away. It's unfortunate that, that technology and social media have given those people a place to stand. Um, I, 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 I weep for us. I weep for us, the readers and the listeners and the viewers who who aren't sure now what's true and what isn't true. Um, and that goes beyond the false flag people, and it goes into some of the mainstream media right now. But uh, if, if we can't make our point with facts, then the point shouldn't be made. And that's just the journalist in me, the old school journalist in me. I probably couldn't get hired in a newspaper today <laughs> With an attitude like that, <laughs> well, they wouldn't let you in. So uh, I mean, they wouldn't. <laughs> so what do you think about that last one, the the Vegas killing? Um, there's been uh, so much talk about that. Uh, d do you feel like it was um, a cover up, or uh, how did you read that? No, I don't feel there's a cover up. Uh, <laughs> you know what? Uh, the, the, those. The mass murders in history from from 1949, when the first real public mass shooting was, to today. So we'll, we'll use that as our as our frame of reference. We always um, latch on to 
to uh, the mass murders that that add some new little wrinkle. The uh, 49 was Howard Unruh. This is the first time somebody walks around and kills people with a gun. This is huge. I'll, I guarantee you the same questions were asked in the Philadelphia newspapers the very next day that we ask now. We just ask them faster because we have that technology now. Uh, by 1965, when Charles Whitman climbs up the tower of the University of Texas and starts killing people, that becomes big news because it went up a tower. Um, 84, we have James Hubert. He goes into a McDonald's, a place where we're supposed to feel safe, and he kills a bunch of people. George Hennard in 91 or 92, whenever it was, um, drives his truck through the plate glass window of a, of a cafeteria and kills people. Uh, Cho at, at uh, the West Virginia, or Virginia Tech, I'm sorry, uh, it goes up and down the campus killing people. Uh, the guy in Las Vegas was really just the latest in that long, that too long line of ordinary uh, lunatics who who thought he could be somebody or be something or wanted to do something, um, and he did. Uh, we don't know. He died. We don't. We've we've seldom known the motives of these killers because they mostly die when they live and they tell us why they did it. We almost always have said. That doesn't make sense. That's stupid. Because it is. They're lunatics. They don't think logically. They don't think rationally. And we want to apply logic and rationality to these things. They don't exist. These are nutcases. They're whack jobs. Uh, and we are always disappointed uh, to when we learn what motivated them to do something. We say it doesn't make sense. If we knew what the Las Vegas shooter's motive really was, we'd still be dissatisfied because it won't make sense. I guarantee you it won't make sense. The fact is he blew his brains out, and we don't have any evidence of his motive. That's not a cover-up. That's We don't know. That's not a, that's not a conspiracy. It's just they don't know. Um, and, and the fact is, that's been the experience of the last, you know, 70 years. We have seldom known. Occasionally, we've been so eager to know, we've made stuff up. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, 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 the, the Howard Unruh, who actually lived in 1949, was said to be just a, a soldier with combat fatigue or shell shock or PTSD, which wasn't named at that time. Um, the fact is, that wasn't it at all. But that's still what people will say about it. People will say Charles Whitman climbed that tower in Texas because he had a brain tumor. Well, that, that, that's not why he did it. They, they completely ignores an, a fabulously abusive childhood, uh, mental problems that that went from here to there, uh, you know. But we want easy, quick answers that make sense to us. The fact is, most of the time, they're 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 not quick, they're not easy, and they don't make sense. Yeah, yeah. It's, it seems to it, well. It, it, I don't know, for some reason it puts people at ease if they can just uh, come up with the answer. You know. uh, that's right. Well, want to know why. Is, that's the most human thing. Uh, that's the most human thing. Why is a natural and a human question? I'm not a psychologist, as I said before. I'm a journalist. And I've spent these past 10 or 12 years wading around in these kinds of stories. Nobody... Nobody wants to know the answers more than the survivors and the loved ones of the dead people. And But uh, while it might be natural for us to want to know, we've got to be patient. We've let those 
those uh, quick conclusions that I talked about, then we were wrong. And, and in our impatience, I think sometimes we've missed our opportunity to truly understand something about these killers. So uh, I, I, patience is warranted, but patience, patience isn't something we do well, we humans. And certainly we modern media consumers. But uh, patience is exactly what we need right now. Well, that's probably where conspiracy theories abound, because like you said, you know, what they do is utter madness. So the solution has got to be fast and just as equally crazy. That's right. Exactly. You're absolutely right. And, uh, you know, my book, Delivered from Evil, which was about the survivors of mass killers, came out on the same day of the Gabby Giffords shooting in Tucson, Arizona. Um, and because of that, well, now I, the, 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 because of that coincidence, uh, I'm, I'm fresh meat for uh, <laughs> national news programs, among them CNN, who call, is calling three and four hours after the crime and wanting to interview me. But they wanted me to comment on how the killer was inspired by right-wing talk radio to attack a demo. Rush Limbaugh made said, me do it. <laughs> and they referred me to his online writings and everything. And I, and I looked at his online writings, and I really saw no evidence of that. They saw what they wanted to see, but I didn't see that evidence. Instead, I got on that night, and they asked their question, and I said, no, I think he's a garden variety a lunatic with a gun. He, 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 he wasn't aiming at the congresswoman uh, in particular. He shot a, a Republican judge. Um, he shot a bunch of people that he didn't know what they were. Uh, he's a garden variety lunatic with a gun. They said, thank you, and cut me off. <laughs> you know, so. <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, that's fine. But now we know. Jared Lochner was a garden variety lunatic with a gun. It had nothing to do with Rush Limbaugh or right wing talk radio or or political hate. Yeah. Uh, no, but, no, he was. In, in, Jared Lochner was in, MK Ultra. Yeah, because I got hey. I, I got attacked on that um, from a cop that I was uh, interviewing, <laughs> who who said that you know the um, same as the Vegas shooter was. Uh, was an anti-Trump, and he was uh, brainwashed by Antifa, anti-fascists. And uh, they called him on the phone in the hotel and said a word to him, and then that made him blast off. And I said that I told them that I thought that was absolutely ridiculous. You know, uh, but he said that it's people like me that are ruining the country. <laughs> and I was like, well, well <laughs> where's that badge of honor? <laughs> Well, I, I was just asking the question of it's like, well, where did you get that from? And, and basically, there's no evidence of that. You might think that, and you might think he looks like that, or whatever drew you to that conclusion, or you heard it on Alex Jones or whatever. But <laughs> how about some some evidence before you do that? I also heard that Hillary Clinton was on the fourth floor of the Mandalay Bay, and she's the one that called him. So... <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I the, the 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 media in the wake of all of these things has tended, and I've seen it going back to 1949, has always been breathless. It's always been impatient, uh, and it has made people breathless and impatient. And we can go down the list of of these terrible things, uh, and and see in the backwash we can see some of the lunacy of our own, of our own culture in dealing with it. Um, that's why I say patience is warranted. We, if we can take a deep breath and let these cops do what they do, um, we more often than not will we'll get answers or we will be convinced that there, are no, that there are no answers to be gotten. In the Vegas shooter's case, I think we might never know his motive, uh, and 
and to a certain degree, I don't really care because whatever they come up with, uh, whatever, if they did have a motive, whatever they would tell us, we would simply not be satisfied with. I, that's the fact. And, and so I, I, I'm, I'm not... I'm not especially interested in the motive of these people. If we can know it, then fine. If we can trust it, then fine. If we can use it to prevent another one, then fine. But if we have to argue about it, then then it's not it's not really going to help. Uh, our point in knowing the motive of of Charles Whitman or George Hennard or Cho or James Huberty or the Vegas shooter should should be directed solely to, to preventing this thing from happening in the future. Um, most of the time, it's not going to, when we know, if we know a motive, it's not going to be helpful to us uh, to know it because it's going to seem rather weird. So uh, I, uh, to, to your original question, um, making stuff up never helps. Using the platforms we now have in social media and, and technological media uh, can be good, but unfortunately there's just a lot of people out there that use it for bad purposes, and, and that's too bad. Um, but that's a reality. Now, would you would you say that there's a difference, though, between trying to understand the motives of a spree killer or, and I'm, I'm trying to word this very carefully, and, and understanding what they're doing? Uh, for, for example, you know, we, okay, we've got the Mandalay Bay shooter. We, we understand what happened. But, then you've got the Malvo case, where where you've got an adult that's almost mentoring, almost trying to recreate himself in a younger man, and and right. takes this boy on a, on a shooting spree that crossed several states. Uh, do we not need to understand how that can happen? Well, what what made Malvo so vulnerable, and what was it about him that he got selected? I think the division that you're trying to make in your question is appropriate. That that um, in cases like the the Muhammad Malvo case, uh, it is important for us to know. It's it's uh, in this case we have both of them and we can analyze them and we can we can explore their psychology and and we can come to some of these conclusions uh, i guarantee you that you and i and those like us in in the crime writing or the crime psychology world uh find this important the great bulk of people stopped at black men arrested for shooting white people, mm -hmm. and and they drew their conclusions with that, knowing Muhammad and Malvo's psychology and their reasons and their motives and their their uh, their methods uh, is important, absolutely important, and it's fascinating. Like I said earlier, knowing. The, the story is fascinating to me because it reflects us. I took that a step further, by the way, and believe that John Allen Muhammad was was influenced by a, an earlier mass murder in New Orleans in 1973 uh, that he saw as a little kid, and and it was a racial incident, and and I believe that Muhammad was influenced by that, uh, but. Uh, the, the example that you pick is is outstanding because there's where we can actually use what we learn to maybe forestall this in in the future. Mm -hmm. um, a lot was learned from John Allen Muhammad and Boyd Malvo. Uh, a lot has been done to adjust. Uh, a lot has been 
done to improve our uh, methods for tracking uh, serial killers like that. So um, it, it, I don't mean to leave the impression that it's not important to know. I just I just try to make the point that for the great bulk of people, um, knowing the motive of the Las Vegas shooter will be meaningless because they'll scratch their heads and say, well, that doesn't make sense. Yeah, absolutely. It will make sense. <laughs> Ops and to hotel keepers and to crime writers. Um, maybe not, not the logic of it, but we'll see how it can help to know uh, everybody else and, and actually, we're past it. I, 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 I believe we're past it. That knowing the motive of the Vegas shooter uh, was, was, is old news now. It was a news story for a few days. And then everybody's attention shifted to something else. And if we come up with a story now and we find a note that he wrote or a diary entry or a video or whatever that he left, uh, and we can say, you know, with some assurance that this was his motive. A lot of people go, hmm, that's interesting. You know, what did Trump say today? Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that, that'll that be the that's it, it, I sound cynical because I am cynical about yeah. the general public and its lack of attention. It's it's the shortness of its attention um, and the shallowness of its understanding. I, I should say the shallowness of what they want to understand. <laughs> you know, that's that's more it. They want they want Malvo and Muhammad boiled down into ten words. And they want it to be racial. And it's never uh, that simple. <laughs> never that simple. It's never that simple. So uh, when we talk about the Vegas shooter, when we talk about the Sutherland Springs shooter uh, and, and, and that, their ilk, um, we, uh, we don't want an exhaustive explanation. We're like Hollywood. We want a 20-line summary of this movie. We don't want, we don't want the script. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I don't want the book. Uh, I want the twenty line summary, the, the twenty word summary. Well, well, that brings so, up a really, a really good point, Ron. Is it? Have we been trained that way that an entire crime can be solved in forty four minutes? You know, absolutely. it's an episode of CSI. Yes, right. there's such a thing that exists in criminology and in jurisprudence, known as the CSI effect, where it, it mainly, it, I think it has a lot of applications, but it was mainly introduced to describe juries who say, what do you mean you don't have DNA evidence? I mean, they have it on, on CSI, and they get it every day. How come you don't have it? Or, or how come you couldn't find out what kind of pizza he ordered on July 6, 1968? I mean... Abby on NCIS can call that up in 10 seconds. <laughs> this, yes. expect, this expectation, a common people, juries specifically, uh, that technology is far greater than it really is, um, is known as the CSI effect. So absolutely. And when we're sitting at home, we're talking to our friends, um, forget being on a jury. We have this expectation that Hollywood was telling us the truth, when when really Hollywood almost never tells us the truth. <laughs> but we think it. We think that they couldn't put it on there if it wasn't true. So yes, absolutely. We we are trained to think that we can determine what pizza you had 38 years ago on a specific date because we think. That was stored someplace in a computer, and if that's true, then any then some benevolent hacker can get in there and find out what it was. Yes. Well, it, not, it, but hasn't that been kind of going on for years? Because uh, the whole 
JFK assassination, um, I think a lot of the, I don't know, how, a, a lot of what's behind it is people thinking, how could we not know what happened? How could someone shoot the president and we don't know? There, there has to be a conspiracy. Isn't that sort of a kind of... Yes. That's, that's the point. We do know. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's this unwillingness that some punk, some, some deluded punk with a gun could change history. So we say, the Warren Commission says, Lee Harvey Oswald killed JFK, and here's how he did it. Well, we don't want to believe that. So we say, well, we don't have the facts, and we, we make up stories. Um, but it I was that easy was, with Lincoln. What's the difference? Uh, Lincoln, uh, there, uh, there, uh, there are Lincoln conspiracy theories. Now, we're not generally familiar with them, but there are Lincoln conspiracy theories. And it's just, we've just moved on from Lincoln. We haven't moved on from JFK. We're not going to move on from Donald Trump. You know, not in our lifetimes. No. Um, and so, you know, history has a way of lapsing, and we have a way of ignoring history. So, but there are Lincoln conspiracy theories. Uh, so, I, but the, the, in JFK's case, we do know what happened. It's just the, 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 the insistence by the public on not believing that, that says, that causes us to say, we don't know the facts. And the fact is, we do know the facts. <laughs> the facts are pretty solidly uh, known and and verified but we just are are reluctant to believe that a punk with a gun a nobody a little man changed history by shooting a great man and if there had to be something more I've said it many times maybe the CIA did want to kill him maybe the Cubans wanted to kill him maybe Maybe uh, the Russians wanted to kill him. They might have all had gunmen in Dealey Plaza that day. The fact is, they all missed except the Harvey Oswald. So, (laughs) there might have been all all those enemies willing to target and wanting to target JFK. But they all missed that day except for Lee Harvey Oswald. Um, so I, I, I think a lot of this is not a flaw in in the crime solving and the crime uh, the sleuthing, but a crime in the crime uh, 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 a flaw in the crime consumer. <laughs> you know, I. I I run into it with my own stories where you, you you see the pieces of paper, you see the pictures, you know what happened, and you say it, and somebody will step forward and say, that's not true. Something else happened, because that's what they want to believe. Um, and it sounds and worse. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then they come out with their own book, maybe, and... and uh, uh, how, how many books are out there on the JFK assassination? It, it should be telling that how many pages of secret, quote unquote, secret documents um, were just released here a few months ago on the JFK assassination. And the most interesting one was about Martin, the most interesting among those documents was about Martin Luther King's sexual appetites. Yeah. Had nothing to do with FK's assassination, and there was nothing else that we learned about. Nothing new that we learned about JFK's assassination in those other twenty-nine thousand nine hundred ninety-nine documents. But they were secret, and and that alone caused a lot of conspiracy theories. But the fact is, uh, there there was nothing there. There was no there there. 
Yeah, actually, in in your book, Morg, you uh, you had a chapter on that where they uh, when they actually dug up uh, Oswald's body because they thought it was not his body or something, right? Right. Well, so again, uh, a conspiracy theory. Um, a, a a respected British journalist named Michael Eddowes uh, wrote a book and floated and made a, a very eloquent case that Oswald, when he went to Russia, uh, stayed in Russia, and then in his place was sent a lookalike uh, Russian agent whose whose purpose ultimately was to kill Kennedy. Um, and and he makes that case. Well, the the only person in the world to whom that that could matter uh, and get something done was Marina Oswald, the widow, and she she didn't buy into it one hundred percent, but she bought into it enough that she said, "Let's exhume the body and prove that it is or it isn't." You know, there was there was talk about how they had burrowed in from a, another grave and done it sideways and things like oh, that. Oh wow! <laughs> they fret so, Oswald. <laughs> my my co-author on the book Morgue, um, Dr. Vincent DeMaio, was uh, on the team that dug up the cactus of Lee Harvey Oswald and peeked inside. And did more than that. They they took the the, the remains that were there, and uh, used them to determine if it was Lee Harvey Oswald's body or not. Now, since you haven't heard any stories about how it wasn't, I think you could safely assume that they found that Oswald was buried in Oswald's grave, um, and they did it with uh, sort of classical Sherlockian. Uh, forensics. They didn't have DNA. They didn't have, you know, things. They just used an X-ray machine and and their own eyes. So, uh, but they did confirm it was Oswald. Uh, there you have uh, a conspiracy theory that was, you know, sold probably at least hundreds of thousands of books. Uh, it just was. Eddowes pulled it out of his southern quarters. <laughs> That's all. Well, how do, how do we know they didn't just kill Oswald when they when they were going to uh, exhume his body, and then they just exchanged the bodies before they could exhume it? Well, <laughs> yeah, well you know, spoken like a true conspiracy theorist. <laughs> well, we don't know, of course, but... And... and but see, that's the classic conspiracy theory thing, that when we prove one isn't true, then, then, then usually they take it one, one step further and, and say, in a way that says, well, your proof is suspect because this new thing, this new idea, this new theory. And we could go and prove that one wrong, and then they would take it one step further. And they, they, they just keep moving the goalposts. Until finally, you've got something that that ultimately couldn't happen. I mean, not 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 if you had a thousand monkeys typing. They would they would come up with Macbeth before they would actually uh, solve this crime the way you would like it solved. So, uh, have there been cover ups in criminal cases? Yes. Um, they're not usually. You're giving you're giving government or law enforcement more credit than they deserve for being that smart in most cases. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that that's the usual thing. The more people that get involved, if you think about Kennedy, how many different people would have had to be in and have would have had to be involved in that kind of a thing, and yeah. that you know. Uh, Fifty something years later, we still don't, we still haven't heard anything from any of them that says, "Oh, hey, I have proof that it didn't happen." Now, yeah. 
Yeah, so, it's, it's an endless cycle. It really is. It what really was, is. What was, what was the most, um, let's say, of, of the books you've written, what was the most, I don't know, I don't want to say shocking, but what, what has stayed with you the longest out of all those books? Well, I, I think The Darkest Night, was because it was so intimate to me and because it was so personal, these were two young girls who were my next-door neighbors, and we were all innocent. And because it so vastly and swiftly changed the culture of this little town where we lived, um, that is was probably by definition the most personal and continues to be the most uh, influential to me. Um, I, I think that uh, in Delivered from Evil, I went out to find these survivors to see what we could learn from them. Because we've all, we've not all been uh, victims of a, of a mass killer or would be victims of a mass killer of some kind, but we've been divorced. We've not gotten a job. We have our own disappointments and our and our own traumas. That's that's the work. Boy. As you know, as a writer, that writing is fun. Having written is more fun. Yeah, <laughs> I agree with that. Well, Ron, it's always good having you on. It's always good conversation. We can talk about almost anything. And, yes, we can. We. Uh, I think yeah, we almost did. did. I think I almost, I only shocked you once, so. Um. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it's been another good episode, and uh, uh, we hope you continue to listen. And uh, our guest today has been Ron Francel. We'll have his books up on the website as well. And thank you very much. Ron, thank, thank you. And, and uh you know, again, good luck. We love being on your show, and I, I'm glad to hear you're adding listeners everywhere. To find out more about our show, guests, or listen to a previous show, visit our website at www.somethingweirdmedia.com. The mission has been completed. The end! By George, he's got it! It is the end! How do you? If you're lying to me, I'll be back. This has been a production of Something Weird Media.